literary works and understandings of rabbits' minds within the rabbit rescue community. She is active in animal rights and rescue, and she founded the Wisconsin chapter of the House Rabbit Society. She writes regularly for the House Rabbit Journal. She recently co-edited Experiencing Animal Minds, which is coming out of Columbia University Press 2012. Thank you. <clears throat> I've lived for nearly 20 years with rabbits by constantly changing my living arrangements to better meet their needs. For eight years, I tried the same approach with my two dogs. Instead of expecting to change their behavior, I continually changed the environment to accommodate their increasingly unmanageable habits. <laughs> Eventually, I, I accepted the need to exert better control. Part one, Lily. I acquired my first dog, Lily, because I wanted a large rabbit that I could take on walks. <laughs> I chose Lily as I have hundreds of rabbits by going to the animal shelter. I mentioned to the kennel worker that I had never had a dog, and she pointed to a tag on a kennel that read Sweetie. I took Sweetie home because I've never turned down any rabbit. Sweetie is now my dog, Lily. I did not want a second dog, but soon I saw a dog walking along the highway in distress. After rehabilitation, this dog, whom I called Lola, um, was attractive and standoffish like a rabbit. Before Lola came into our lives, Lily and I had gone to obedience training with unhappy results. I often found myself standing alone in the room while Lily ran off to obey the commands of other people to their dogs. <laughs> Lily learned to sit, lie down, and stay, and she executed these behaviors well for other dog owners in the class and for me when she was not busy. I came to believe that training was for naturally compliant dogs perfectly matched with their human caretakers. Understanding that dogs need exercise, I took Lily to a baseball field three blocks from my house for throw and fetch. Lily would jump to my face and grab the top of my coat with her teeth. Soon she jumped the four-foot fence and ran off for 12 hours. I regularly took Lily for walks on an extens extension leash until she killed a wild rabbit on the side of the road. I arranged play dates with two local dogs but was soon asked to keep Lily home because she was too competitive. I saved $2,000 to buy a six-foot fence for my backyard. The first afternoon I put her behind it, I saw Lily playing in the street. She had climbed over it. I electrified the top of the fence. When a stunned squirrel fell on the opposite side, Lily tore a hole through the chain link, killing the squirrel, and as always, running away. I then had to regularly patrol and mend the fence, which has a second three-foot layer of mesh around the inside, metal stakes anchoring the bottom to the ground, and a hot wire running along the top. <laughs> One day I decided that I would give dog training another try. I was open to dog training. I had gone to class with Lily. I had read books. I had taken Lola to obedience class. When she refused to go in, I took the class while she waited in the car. <laughs> So I did know about training. People like me who do not train their dogs have a bad reputation, but I don't think it is because we have weak characters or befuddled philosophies. I found it irrelevant to the dog behaviors I really needed to change. I didn't see much use for sit, stay, or fetch. I happened to see Cesar Milan's television show on an airline flight while I was thinking about retrying training. He said things I already believed. He said that just because a dog is well trained in obedience techniques does not mean that it is necessarily well behaved. He did not say that all dogs wanted an alpha human as a master, but rather that if the human did not become the leader, the household dog would assume the role. Committed to saving dogs rather than breeding more of them, he had a dog pack of, uh, of 40 rescued dogs and that impressed me. That a dog was in control of my house dawned on me when I first gave my dogs a determined command to stay away from the front door. I watched horrified as Lola looked to Lily for directions. Mm -hmm. I knew that Lily was in charge of our household and I already really knew this because of the difference between the two dogs. Lola rarely sat in my chair and if there when, and if there, when I came into the room she jumped off immediately. Lily always sits in my chair and never moves without orders to vacate. Lola comes to reassert re to receive reassurances and to give me licks on the cheek. Lily has yet to lick my hand. Lola would never sit with her front legs across my body. Lily pins me down whenever we sit ne next to each other. 
Lola submits to the leash immediately. Lily paces before she will hold still long enough for me to grab her and latch it. And thus I realized that taking authority from Lily was going to require nearly a change in who I was. Two, submitting to leadership. Exposed to Milan's views, I realized that I needed to become leader of the pack. In my pre-Milan days, I had understood that the human became pack leader in one of three ways. She might be cosmically blessed with a naturally compliant dog. This was the good dog narrative, and I can give you a list as long as my arm of literary stories that depict a dog as a soul correspondent to the human one. In the second model, the human enacts symbolic actions that the dogs read as signaling human alpha status. This includes human going through doors first, humans forbidding dog to sit on or above humans, human making dog perform before receiving food, human eating in front of dog without sharing. In these scenarios, human behaviors teach the dog that the human is in charge. I saw no evidence that my dogs were such symbolic thinkers. In the third model, the humans control recalcitrant, recalc recalcitrant dog uh, by physical force, electric collars and fences, wax with the newspaper. What was missing in all of these was a coherent conceptual framework that made sense of dogs. That framework uh, was provided to me by the Milan program uh, and was the dog pack, the roles of leaders and follower within the pack. At the practical level, Milan's program advocated becoming the leader of one's dogs by exercise and discipline in the form of rules, boundaries, and limitations before affection. The exercise in question is always the walk, which is intended to recapitulate the primal experience of migrating in packs. The walk establishes the authority of the pack leader, in this case the human, to determine the course for the group, where to go, when to stop, how to respond to events along the way. I began teaching, uh, taking each of my dogs on this kind of walk. Coincidentally, I also began a practice of meditation unrelated to my work with dogs. Meditation allowed me to work through my confusion about the relationship between affection and submission. This was because over the months I came to experience my own submission through meditation. Because meditation requires the practitioner to give up language thought, it includes the discomfort of losing the control that comes with language. Without language, I have the sense of simply noticing without reacting to the phenomena around me. I came to understand that submission could be for me and my dogs less about enforced execution of my will on them and more about awareness to the triggers that set all of us into an active and reactive state. Submission meant simply a heightened ability not to respond. Lola submits to her fear of other do uh, responds to her fear of other dogs by explosive attacks. She is thus difficult to walk in my neighborhood because it is full of dogs frustrated by excessive confinement. Some are loose. The problem or the opportunity for me was that I was also very afraid of these dogs. In the course of meditation, I submitted to this fear, simply giving in to the eminent likelihood of my death by dog. <laughs> Once I accepted that Lola and I would be killed by a deranged human, canine, I was able to, <laughs> possibly two, I was able to force her to confront her fears as I had mine. Once she saw that she had no choice but to walk past these dogs without reacting, she submitted. We now easily walk past all of the dogs, many of whom no longer threaten us. I've come to appreciate Milan's point that submission Forgoing the attempt to control can give the gift of a balanced psychological state. Becoming leader to my dogs was an act of submission on my part. I never wanted to play the dominant role. I just wanted to hang out with animals. But I understood that I had to change. Particularly, I had to address Lily's challenge to my authority. Lily was never aggressive toward me, but she seemed to expect to co-manage the household, constantly pushing herself ahead of me to make decisions about what we were going to do. Lily was picked up by animal control in an, in an area notorious for dog fighting, and she may have been part of a dog-human training agenda that makes a dog an, an extension of the human. She has wire-cut scars on her feet and a bottom full of buckshot, suggesting that she was a successful stray as well. In any case, she is an extraordinary athlete and a survivor. Whenever I've tried to exercise authority over her, she has always made me feel that I did not understand the rules. 
I gave Lily's submission avoidance full scope for eight years, and the result for me was a lack of confidence that I was a better dog for the job of pack leader than she was. Now, thanks to Milan, I've recouped my authority to some degree. I walk both dogs at the same time and control them well. According to Milan, the leader of the pack is the one with a particular kind of energy that he calls calm assertiveness, which I try to cultivate. But what really turned me around was realizing that Lily's independence was an excessive individualism that seemed very undog-like. Three, dominance and loss of affection. For me, affection has always been a circuit between equals, and my love of Lily was based on my respect for her as an equal in the competencies of living. When I accepted the necessity of becoming pack leader, I did not know how to express affection or even how to feel it toward my dogs. My affection had been those bouts of tenderness expressed by pats and hugs or by dramatic acts of, acts of protection. I've plunged into the lake at night to pull Lily off a wild animal I could not see. I've faked illness to stay home when she's run away yet again. I've left the front door open until Lily came home in the middle of the night caked in slime. I think this qualifies as affection, but I know that it does not register that way to her. I had to learn to give affection from the place of pack leader, but how? Eventually, I noticed that the dogs gave affection within the context of power. Affection seems for them not paroxysms of tenderness nor a commitment to pay the mortgage, but acknowledgement <laughs> of role. And so now I express my affection as a scratch behind the ears and soft words when they show the calm submissiveness of good pack members, although this kind of affection still seems a bit tepid to me. If I need con needed confirmation about the need to step up to leadership, I got it in the form of a video about a private shelter. The owner seemed to operate for al almost limitless affection for the dogs. Nevertheless, I watched her tell one couple that their dog's food aggressive aggressiveness made him dangerous. I thought of a similar scenario wherein Milan addressed food aggression in a more difficult dog. He was successful, she was not. I could see the likelihood that this woman's affections could cost the dog his life. Sometime later, I learned that she advocated euthanasia over no-kill shelters. One of the great injustices of life seems to be that our strengths can so easily become our liabilities. My affection for my dogs was such a case. It needed reassessment before it injured the very beings I set out to help. <laughs>